Religion has been an important aspect of human history. Since ancient times, humans have sought out purpose, meaning, and togetherness. Christianity and Islam played a dynamic role in African history once a critical mass adhered to Abrahamic precepts. Africans became just as pious and faithful as any other, yet, when it came to the idea of religious brotherhood, there always seemed to be a disconnect. This ambivalence unfortunately revealed a darker side, demonstrating how religious nations, at times, didn't practice what they preached. What up African world, it's Home Seam here and welcome back to another video of African history, culture, and worldview. By supporting this channel on Patreon, you're helping in the creation of these videos and contributing to this content. The link to Patreon is in the description box below. Also, stay tuned with a word from my sponsors. Hello, my name is Howard Dorsey. I'm 54 years old. I'm here to talk about my uh, experience with herbal results. Um, I was getting sick, so I, I went to the doctor and they told me that um, my blood pressure was high, my cholesterol was borderline or high, so I was very sick. You know, I thought I was, sometimes I thought I was dying at, at some point. And uh, I ordered a bottle of olive leaf extract. This is, this is how the bottle comes in. And within the first probably week and a half, two weeks, I checked my blood pressure and it was back down to normal. It was like 120 over 80. My cholesterol went down to uh, 125. You know, I definitely believe that olive leaf extract from Herbal Results saved my life. And I, that's real. I mean, I, 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 and I recommend it to everyone in my family, my friends, and we've seen a lot of results in that, in that manner as well. Purchase now at HerbalResults.net. To begin, the purpose of this video is not to cast judgment on the religions of Christianity or Islam. It's clear that the Abrahamic religions played various roles on the continent of Africa and cannot be painted in a singular light. Historically, there's been a distinct difference between religious teachings and their human followers. Hopefully that difference will be illustrated in this video today. Moreover, it's important to note that this video is just a theory. Interpretations of historical events may or may not align with reality. And so for clarity, this video will be presenting some interpretations based on my analysis of historical events, so please keep this context in mind. To be direct, African states were fooled by foreign religions because of their obstinate belief in religious brotherhood. This is not to say that religious brotherhood between nations and various ethnicities did not exist, but it was clearly subject to change. I'll use two examples from West and Central Africa to illustrate my point. Islam entered West Africa via the Arab invasion of the Northern Sahara in the 7th century. Many Amazigh people converted to Islam and began spreading the religion south of the Sahara. The Trans-Saharan trade undoubtedly helped to spread Islam, as the Amazigh people were not only trading objects but ideas. The conversion of many Amazigh people created a cultural shift in the Maghreb. Several Amazigh rulers and elites not only became believers, but they also adopted the identity of Arab lineages. This was perhaps the most dynamic cultural shift for the Northern Sahara region. One scholar describes this cultural phenomenon as genealogical determinism. Notions of gender and race were constructed differently in Morocco and other North African Islamic societies than in the American South. This difference can be seen in that many Moroccan rulers were sons of ex-slave black women, but thought of themselves as Arabs and Sharif. This genealogical determinism has racialist implications because it favors one ethnic group over the other. In Moroccan society, patrilineage from the Prophet Muhammad was often emphasized and black ancestry was often stigmatized. Empowered by new Arab identity, elite Muslims in Morocco advanced a different model of Islam than their fellow Africans below the Sahara, a religious brotherhood seemingly contingent upon capitalist opportunity. The 1591 Moroccan invasion of the Songhai Empire sent shockwaves through West Africa. West African scholars and soldiers alike were dismayed. Ahmed Baba, 
the most celebrated scholar of Timbuktu in the 16th century, had an opportunity to address the Moroccan Sultan directly concerning the issue of Muslim infighting. Ahmed Baba's scholarship was recognized throughout Morocco, and when he finally was able to speak in person to the Sultan of Morocco, he asked him why he invaded Songhai, which was an Islamic country, articulating his countrymen's indignation. The Sultan replied, for the unity of the lands of Islam. It was clear that this rationale of forced unity brought Morocco access to more gold and black slaves. The Songhai were utterly perplexed because the religion introduced to them by these same pious Amazigh centuries ago proclaimed no Muslim or Muslim violence. In fact, these exact sentiments were vocalized by the Songhai on the battlefield. The swords of Jadar and his forces held judgment over their necks until the people of the Sudan cried out, We are Muslims, we are your brothers in faith, as the swords were doing their work among them. It's clear that the Songhai were shocked and attempted to evoke the religious brotherhood formed centuries ago. It would seem a glaring contradiction, however, considering the fighting between the Mali and Songhai states, but in the minds of the people, this inconsistency was non-existent, perhaps because it was viewed as a local matter. We can't say for sure, but religious brotherhood, for whatever reason, was seemingly not an expectation between the Mandinka and the Songhai. The fact that the Songhai would utter those desperate words to the Moroccans and not the Mandinka is difficult to understand. However, the point may demonstrate that the socio-religious expectations regarding infighting within the Sudan was quite different for an engagement between the Sudan and a foreign Muslim state. In Central Africa, Christianity reached the Congo Empire in the 15th century. Consolidation of its authority didn't occur amongst the Congo elite until the reign of King Mbemba Nzinga. If religious brotherhood needed a logo, he undoubtedly would be the face of it. King Mbemba Nzinga wholeheartedly believed in the Christian faith and his brotherhood with the Portuguese, a precedent likely set by his father, King Nzinga Nku, also known as King Joao. It was not long before, in fact, Joao I of Congo was himself exchanging letters with Manuel I as brother. King Mvemba Nzinga attempted to model this African civilization through a Christian framework and sent his children and that of his nobles to Europe to study and become priests. The Portuguese played the part of royal brother for a time, but ultimately, like the Moroccans, capitalist ambition won the day. Though the Portuguese had converted Congo on friendly terms, they began to view the African state not as a Christian brother, but as quasi-subordinate. Portuguese letters to Mvemba and Zinga demonstrate this reality with its paternalistic undertone. While Dom Alfonso addresses the Portuguese king as Sua Vosa Alteza Noso Irmao, Your Highness, Our Brother, the proper form of address in correspondence between equal monarchs, Dom Joao casts his response in the second person plural while he refers to himself in the first person singular, you, rather, than in the proper first-person plural using the royal nos, we. This form of address could imply intimacy and familiarity of personal friendship, but the unilaterality and context of the letter make it clear that it was meant as a condescending affront. Letters between Portuguese and Congo kings were not always condescending. It gradually transformed over time, indicative of their capitalist purpose King Mvemba and Zinga's concern about the lawlessness of the Atlantic slave trade fell on deaf ears amongst the Portuguese crown. Over time, Congo was not a utility in religious brotherhood, but a source of revenue and enslaved people. The appeal of religious brotherhood marketed to African states below the Sahara weakened their ability to respond effectively to the capitalist motives of other nations. Though this is just a theory, I'm hoping I provided some evidence to secure consideration or further examination. Well, I'm all out, guys. If you like these videos and want to help in its continued production, consider supporting the home team on Patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. No less self. Remember your ancestors. Peace.